Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We will start another uh, chapter, which is another difficult chapter, reproduction in humans. And this is the topic-wise, uh, topic-wise questions on it. And I hope this helps you for your exams on Monday. Now let's start with question number one. Figure 3.1 shows some stages in human reproduction. There's a sperm and then there's ovum and then they've said A. So that is what is that process? That's fertilization. Now, if you look at fertilization, I've drawn this diagram to explain something to you. This is the ovum. Ovum has a haploid gamete. That's why I've written N. N is the haploid number. And the sperm has also N. So that I've given it a black color. Now, when they fuse, now look at how I've drawn it. The male and the female gamete nuclei fuse. And this, what is formed, is called the zygote. The zygote is the one cell which is the beginning of every human being, every animal, every plant. And this is a diploid zygote. But please remember, it does not contain any information of the cytoplasm of the sperm. Even the mitochondria which is present, even the mitochondria which is present in the ovum is the mitochondria which is present in the zygote. That is why we have Eve's DNA. Adam and Eve, Hazrat Adam, Adam Salaam and Hazrat Hawa. So we all carry the mitochondria of Hazrat Hawa. That, Hawa. that is why it is called Eve's DNA. So the mitochondria of the zygote is the mitochondria of the ovum. I can think of a question which they can ask you on this. So the male haploid nucleus comes from the sperm and the female haploid nucleus comes from the ovum, but the zygote cytoplasm is that of the ovum. The zygote cytoplasm is that of the ovum. So only the male nucleus comes and fuses with it and then forms the diploid zygote. Pause this and listen to my story once again. So the cytoplasm of the zygote is the cytoplasm of the ovum. And all the organelles have come from the ovum. So let's continue with the question. So they've given you this question. There are two, there's a one zygote, then divide into two, two different human beings, baby one, baby two. Name the process that occurs at the end state, where in the reproductive system fertilization. It's underlined, you couldn't have used any other word. It says name the process. You couldn't have said fusion of the male and the female gamete nucleus, though it is what it is. But the word is name, name the process. If I ask you, what is your name? You'll say, well, that's my name. But you won't tell me your address. You're just telling me your name. Where does it occur in the OV duct? Or if you said fallopian tube, that was fine as well. Name the type of cell division taking place at BNC. That's mitosis, which is the normal cell division, which adds cells for growth, asexual reproduction, repair, repair of tissues. Do not ever say repair of cells. The two embryos develop, are born, and grow to become adults. Suggest two ways in which the two adults must be similar. If they are boy, if one is a boy, the other must be a boy as well, because they have developed from one cell the zygote. It was one zygote which has formed two different human beings, so they are genetically the same. Their blood group will be the same. The color of the eyes will be the same. The shape of the nose will be the same. You must have seen identical twins. They look exactly alike. An explanation is that they both inherit identical genes and they both arise from the same zygote. From that one cell, the zygote, that zygote divides by mitosis into two. And the two cells form two human beings. Now, normally, this doesn't happen. I don't think any of you is an identical twin. Maybe there is one, but I don't have an identical twin. So they both inherit identical genes and they both arise from the same zygote. You see, if it was the other type of twins, then two ovums would be fertilized by two different sperms. And maybe one could be a boy and one could be a girl. So they could be fraternal twins. Maybe both could be girls. But then if they are two different ovum and two different sperms, but just by chance it happens on the same day. So they probably have their same day is birthday of the brother and the sister. Those are called fraternal twins. But these are identical twins. Then it says, the part of the question suggests two ways in which they may differ from one another and explain your answer. They could differ in size, in their weight. Maybe one didn't get enough food. Maybe one did not, uh, maybe was sick as a child, developed some disease, and he did not grow that tall. And one eats a lot. One has a lot of, maybe he's a voracious eater and he's put on a lot of weight. Maybe your skin color. One stands in the sun all day. Uh, maybe has, does some work which involves... Uh, exposed to the sun, so he's tanned. Now, explanations are naturally size is lack of food. 
if one did not get enough food and one got enough food, then exposure to the sun, then genes are only partly responsible. Like for instance, obesity is not something which is your genes are responsible. You're partly responsible. Maybe you have the gene for obesity, but then you didn't eat a lot, so you didn't become obese. Maybe one of the child had an accident playing football and broke his leg. Well, the other child is not going to have a broken leg. So environmental factors which are going to affect you will be your height. Maybe you didn't get enough calcium and proteins in your diet. You did not grow tall. Just like plants. There are two plants. You plant them. One does not get enough light. One does not get enough nitrates from the soil. It doesn't grow that tall. The other one gets enough light and gets enough nitrates and phosphates from the soil and grows taller. Question two, at puberty, hormones are produced that are responsible for the development of secondary sexual characteristics. Name one secondary sexual characteristics in males. So a deeper voice, you could have said hair on the face, you could have said stronger muscles, you could have said sperm production. Now name the hormone responsible for the development of secondary sexual characteristics in males, that's the hormone testosterone. Name the organs that produce this hormone, testes. Then figure 3.1 shows the concentration of blood of two hormones, F and G, involved in a woman's menstrual cycle. And you know the menstrual cycle, how it lasts for 28 days or four weeks. And you see the concentration of hormone on this side. And then there are two hormones they've shown you. And this is the day 14 here, which is the time when ovulation takes place. And everybody should be knowing that. So name the hormones F and G. F is estrogen, uh, G is progesterone. If it's underlined, it means that you had to use these words. You couldn't have used anything else. It's an underlined means it's an essential marking scheme point. A state what occurs at time H is ovulation. If you didn't remember the word ovulation, you could have said release of the ovum or the release of the egg. Now let's come to question number three. Figure 3.1 shows a fetus developing in the uterus of a mother. The fluid labeled C contains cells from the fetus. You must understand it does not contain any cells of the mother because this am amnion is a closed sac which just encloses the fetus. A long hollow needle may be used to withdraw some of the fluid into a syringe. That's called amniocentesis. The DNA from the cells in this fluid can be analyzed. So these are fetal cells to find the sex of the fetus and to detect any mutations which might be present. Because mutations are always present in the DNA. So we want to get the DNA of the fetal cells. So you can see the fluid C, the uterus wall, the long needle, and we are removing a bit of the C. Name fluid C and state its function. It's Fluid C is amniotic fluid. Whether you wrote fluid or not, doesn't matter. Amniotic is the name of the fluid. And what does it do? It prevents damage to the fetus. Why? Because when the mother moves around or she goes to sleep or she's sitting, the fetus cannot be in a totally dry environment. It has to be in a fluid environment which protects it. So it's protecting the fetus when the mother sleeps or she's lying down or she's standing. So it is protecting, it prevents damage to the fetus. So, label the placenta. Now, I've colored that green for you all to understand that this was the placenta. And then the umbilical cord is the one which I have made in red. So, I just remove it so for you all to then again see it. So, the placenta was this part. And then, of course, from the placenta, this is the placenta. And then you have the umbilical cord coming out of it, which joins the placenta to the fetus. So label the placenta using the line and the letter P. Then state two functions of the placenta. What do they do? I always say placenta is like the Vaga border between India and Pakistan. So it allows the exchange of nutrients. It does not provide. It's not a provider. It doesn't produce anything. The mother's blood is on one side and the fetal blood is on one side. So it allows the exchange of neutrons. From the mother's blood, oxygen will diffuse this side to the fetal blood. Carbon dioxide, because the fetal cells are respiring and producing carbon dioxide, so they will diffuse from the fetal blood into the mother's blood. And the mother's lungs will remove this carbon dioxide. So, for nine months, 
her lungs are working to keep you alive. So exchange of nutrients, exchange of gases, it's exchange is the word you have to use everywhere. Exchange of gases, exchange of antibodies. The mother has had some diseases. She has antibodies to certain diseases. Well, those will cross to the fetus and protect it. And it prevents mixing of the maternal and the fetal blood because blood groups can be different. I said can be different. I didn't say will be different. They can be the same as well. If the, both the parents are blood group A, the child can be A. If the, both the parents are blood group O, then the child has to be O. But if both the parents are A group, then the child can be A as well as O. We'll do this in the chapter on inheritance. It says C part, figure 3.2 shows the chromosome is found in the nucleus of one cell of a developing fetus. Now you know the 22 pairs are called the body chromosomes, but the 23rd pair decides the gender of the child, of the fetus. If one chromosome is, I said, longer and one is shorter, then we call it, we as biologists call it X and Y. X and Y is not written on it. The shorter one we call Y. But if both are the same length and the same shape and the same size, then we call it XX and this has to be a female child while this is a male child. So all male, all men, all boys will always have the XY chromosome in every cell of their body, in every cell of their body. State the sex of the fetus, explain your answer, why it's a male, and the reason is because it contains the Y chromosome. Then you have the fetus has a mutation. Describe the mutation shown in figure 3.2. Well, you can see here, on chromosome number 21, instead of a pair, there are three chromosomes. So there's one extra chromosome on pair number 21. You could see this in the diagram. And then what is the name of this disease or what is the name of this condition? It won't be a disease, I'm sorry. It is a condition, genetic disorder, and that's called Down syndrome. Now this is part of your syllabus. That is why they have to ask you a question. I always say when we make a question as an examiner, we have to Specify chapter one, part A, which part of the syllabus are we examining in this question? So if you know the syllabus well, and if you've understood the syllabus well, well, that's it, and A is definite. Then coming to question number five, figure 2.1 shows a fetus developing inside its mother. Now you know B is the amnion, C is the amniotic fluid, D is the placenta, E is the lining of the uterus, and F is the muscle in the wall of the uterus. Now it says complete table 2.1 using letters from figure 2.1 to identify each of the following. A structure that contains urea released by the fetus. Now that could be C because some of the, the fetus urinates in the amniotic fluid and drinks that fluid and sort of it could be there. It could be D because it's in the placenta. And it could be E because that's the endometrium or the lining of the uterus of the mother. So because it's going to cross over there. So it could be C, D or E, but you could have only written one. A region that contains cells, all, almost all of which would be used for determining the sex of the fetus. So that would be C or it could be D as well because the placenta is also made up of the fetal genetic material. Because you see, when the zygote divides into a ball of cells, then that ball of cells comes and implants in the uterus. And then this ball of cells, this ball of cells and some of the cells separate and become part of the placenta. So it is the fetal genetic material which forms the placenta. So it could be C or D. Then it's a structure that is uh, used to expel the fetus at birth. Now that is F. Why? Because this is the muscle in the wall of the uterus which actually expels it. Where this, uh, the mother has these rhythmic contractions which are called the labor pains. And so muscle in the wall of the uterus contracts, relax, contract, relax, and then the cervix opens and then the fetus is pushed out. A temporary structure that would have been expelled during the menstruation if pregnancy had not occurred. Now that had to be E because E was the this would be the lining of the lining of the uterus. So I think it was in 
difficult question. Now, some of you would have got some of this wrong. Then coming to the B part of the question, everyday babies are born suffering from severe withdrawal symptoms, sadly, as a result of their mother taking drugs during pregnancy. Pathetic. Name a drug which the mother may have taken during pregnancy that might cause these withdrawal symptoms. So she could have been a heroin addict, she could have been an alcohol addict, she could be smoking, so nicotine addict. Then suggest how the drugs taken by the mother have been able to affect her developing fetus. So carbon monoxide in the mother's blood will diffuse across the placenta, enter the blood of the fetus, and then it will either the umbilical cord or you say the umbilical vein because the umbilical vein carries oxygenated blood from the placenta to the fetus. So how drugs have been able to affect and what will be the effect be, which is not asked in the question, but what will be the effect be? You see carbon monoxide binds to the hemoglobin, it's a permanent binding. So less oxygen carrying capacity, so less oxygen reaching the fetus, less aerobic respiration, less tissue respiration, less energy released, less growth. So we say the fetus will be reduced birth weight. Reduced birth weight, that's part of your syllabus point. Eh? Reduce birth weight. So what they do is, they, how would have they figured this out? They would have figured this out. They would have weighed maybe 10,000 babies of women who don't smoke and 10,000 babies of women who smoke and they would have found out an average. And that mean would show you that women who smoked had smaller babies. Otherwise, you can't make this generalization and make a statement that women who smoke have uh, fetus are small. When they are born, the baby is small in weight or is small in size. So they must have done all this research and then they've come that women who smoke have babies with reduced birth weight. I'm sure all of you know your birth weight. If you asked your mother, they, she would be telling you, you were so many pounds, you were so many pounds. So that is called the birth weight when they weigh the baby as soon as the baby is born. So reduced birth weight. Uh, that completes this few questions on this chapter and I'll try my best to get some more questions done uh, before your exams and I hope this has been a helpful exercise and thanks for watching.